Hello, my name is Brenna Decker, and I'm a fourth-year PhD student in the Department of Biology at the Logan USU campus. Today, I will discuss my combined interest in teaching, interpretation, and museum studies, and how each can aid in course design. First, I want to explore my concept of teaching. Education, according to the Oxford Dictionary, has two definitions. The first one is obvious, the process of receiving uh, or giving systematic instruction, especially at a school or university. It aligns with the general mission statements of institution, especially with standardized tests and the evaluation through our grading system. But the second is sometimes overlooked. As educators and teachers, our goal tends to align with the first definition, However, addressing education as an enlightening experience may lead to greater student involvement, participation, and increased information retention, enhancing broad applicability of skills. While I've mostly been a teaching assistant for undergraduate biology courses, I had the opportunity to co-teach a natural resource interpretation course in person in fall of 2021 after taking the course myself virtually in 2020. In fall 2021, we were able to take students off campus to many different interpretive displays paired with activities that drew on their week's reading in relation to the theories behind designs and effectiveness. The definition of education has traditionally focused more on the passing of information, while the definition of interpretation originating from Friedman Tilden's 1957 book, Interpreting Our Heritage, extends interpretation further as an educational activity which aims to reveal meaning and relationships through the use of original objects by first-hand experience and by illustrative media, rather than simply communicating factual information. In this course, we learn several different theories and learning strategies that can be used in any interpretive field. While interpretation and education are considered separate fields with slightly different definitions, the theories and learning strategies can greatly help guide classroom and laboratory design in university settings. I want to go over four such techniques before showing how I'm using the theories to guide a new course design. The first is Bloom's taxonomy, which seems to be the predominant theory used for education. Information is first recognized, remembered, and understood. After the information is processed individually, it can then be applied, analyzed, and evaluated. After a lot of practice with this, the information or the thinking techniques used in conjunction with the information can be used in new and creative ways. This theory is commonly used to base teaching philosophies in biology departments, but there are many more specific and insightful techniques that can be incorporated and aid in addressing each of these levels. The first theory that I like to employ is the theory of reasoned action, where, as educators, we have to understand that our students come in with already established attitudes towards the topics whether those attitudes are based on behaviors or subjective societal norms. Any interpretation that does not somehow relate what is being displayed or described to something within the personality or experience of the visitor will be sterile. In interpretation, the theory of reason action addresses the action or behavioral change that the interpretation is supposed to influence. So if there is no connections, there is no learning, and therefore no behavioral change. This merges with two other ideas, meaning-making and constructivist theory. New information is learned by incorporating it into one's own mind scaffold. If there is no relation between the information and one's personal life experiences, including their uh, preconceived notions or social formalities, the information is not learned. The instructor can facilitate the learning process using guided discussions where students communicate their thoughts with classmates, 
which can spark new ideas, new meanings, and allow room for novel interpretations that may connect easier to previous knowledge and understandings. Both include an understanding that the student already has a scaffold structured around the ideas presented in a class, and their way of understanding that information must fit within their prior thinkings before it can be learned. Fitting information into one scaffold can also be accomplished using flow learning, which is described as a four-step process. Awaken enthusiasm, focus attention, direct experience, and share inspiration. Flow learning requires a lot of direction from the instructor up front and when switching tasks, but it is still highly driven by student involvement and independence allowing student agency while aiding in minimizing distractions helps build on the student scaffold in a way the student learns versus trying to force information into that scaffold. The threshold fear and posture theories are based on the understanding that each individual cannot learn or incorporate new information if there are high underlying levels of fear. Many times these types of theories are not included in teaching philosophies, but it does play a critical role in understanding course outcomes. Threshold fear is actually a theory based in museum studies, described as the anxiety felt by a potential visitor, which can become a barrier that prevents them from enjoying or even entering a space. A student may see a classroom as an unwelcoming space, depending on their personal past experiences in such spaces. A simple change in room organization, such as from stagnant on the left to more interactive on the right, can help alleviate some of these fears. <coughs> Proster theory states that learning is an active brain task. So if the brain is occupied with the basic needs of survival and other anxieties relating to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then learning cannot take place as there is no mental capacity available for new information. Fears pro possibly mostly seen in our grading system, where students are fearful that if they do not get an A, everything is ruined. Other fears include claustrophobia, depending on what room we are assigned to teach in, social fear, in that many students, including myself, do not like speaking up when there are many other students in the room, or simply having their mind preoccupied with other courses or other personal situations. Many of these fears, as instructors, we cannot control for, but it is important to understand that these can be negatively affecting your students throughout the semesters and emphasizes that we need to clearly communicate with each student. So I wanted to take these ideas in and incorporate them into a new course that I hope to co-teach with Dr. Molly Cannon in the Anthropology Department, focusing on collection material handling, and um, it will be incorporated in it into the Museum Studies Certificate Program through the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. But why, first, study and maintain collections? Collections encompass our human history as well as the history of our planet. We can learn a lot from collection material, including identifying causes of planetary changes and changes in human thought processes. The materials housed in collections, we can discover new species, new interactions, new ideas, and eventually plan for our future. Through the process of understanding our history, learning, and finding new connections, we can all interact with the world around us from a broader and more encompassing perspective to help solve future problems. I created six course components to build that skill set for each student. The first is providing readings and real world examples for students to explore individually before group discussion, providing them with an opportunity to find their own meanings in the material 
and aid in the incorporation of new information into their own mind scaffolds. Second, bringing those meanings to the group provides opportunities to build communication skills and initiate collaborations among students, providing a safe environment to express one's opinions and to get feedback. This continues to build on those scaffolds. Third, igniting interest for the material using hands-on activities facilitates the enthusiasm for the topic, and it often sparks new ideas. Fourth, because this course will focus more on the biological collections, some students may be squeamish with a variety of biological materials, thinking about dead animals. Um, so some of the optional labs that I would include, include visiting a taxidermist, a local taxidermist, and preparing bird study skins. Fifth, in order to aid in student learning, I plan to have each make their own learning objectives on the first day of class, which we will revisit throughout the course one-on-one -on -one to help facilitate each student's individual and personalized goals. The last component is a final project that will allow students to experience the art of writing by compiling a grant proposal and presentation related to the collections of their choice. The options for these proposals can be vast, from getting money to create a new exhibition, to creating a facility proposal for new spaces to properly house specific collection material, to requesting money for digitization and hiring efforts. An example workflow for an individual student during the course could be as follows. First, we read about and discuss the horrific fire that burned down Brazil's National Museum, along with other examples of unmanaged and unmaintained facility disasters. Then visit one of our collections on campus, such as the Fish Teaching Collection, to aid in maintaining ethanol levels in those collection jars. And finally, writing a proposal to further enhance and maintain that particular collection in order to preserve the collection material's integrity for teaching, research, and outreach. Now, I would like you all to take this example and write out a few workflows for your own course. What types of paths do you want students to take throughout your course? What paths can you expect to see given your course learning objectives and the available materials? And list any learning theories that would help you facilitate a student's achievement. The goal is to provide practice in developing broad, well-rounded critical thinkers that can not only manage and maintain collections and their respective materials for future generations, but also apply their skills in other areas of interest. After all, teaching should both incorporate the materials and knowledge, be an enlightening experience, as well as translate to all facets of life. Thank you for watching this presentation, and I am happy to discuss more with you at the conference or through email. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.